uh, you know, got all the data, looked through it. In order to get the GGLD, the shares outstanding, the market cap uh, back to an 11% overvalued state versus historic average, we're looking at gold 3,700 basically over the next year. The rate cutting cycle is like a year. So over the next 12, 13 months, I'm looking for gold 3,700. Uh, that was a lot, a lot of great info, but I have a lot of questions and I want to start again with GLD. I just wrote these numbers down. You said there's 400 million shares outstanding. And now that was in 2020. Is that correct? Uh, there's 300 mil outstanding now in 2020, there were about 430 million. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea. Garrett Goggin, how you doing? Hey, good, Andy. Thanks for uh, having me. Nice to talk. No, to thanks you. for coming on uh, board here. I have uh, did a little bit preliminary research, well, actually a lot of preliminary research, and I really like how you start with a macro, a macro thesis on the metals prices, and then you, but then you dial it down really to the micro with some specific companies. And so let's start with the macro first. Gold's looking to break out or it has broken out. It seems like it's forming a new base here around 2,500. What's your uh, projections and what's your thesis on this breakout and where we're going? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I'm a fundamental analyst um, from the Boston Institutional Community. I'm a CFA, MBA. Um, you know, I go through the 10 Qs. I go through the MDNAs um, and, you know, make uh, economic forecasts based off, you know, the grade and the recovery and the costs in order to generate, you know, values for, you know, the equities that I follow. So it's all database and evidence-based. And then, you know, a lot of these interviews, I've done a few of them. Um, and it's funny because uh, some of the videos are very popular, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of views. And a lot of it is like doom and bloomers, you know, gold's going to 50 thou. They tell a good story, but there's no facts or data or evidence behind it. And, you know, I like math. I like, you know, uh, probability and statistics. And, you know, the in writing my latest report, the GP10X, I was looking at the gold price and I was looking at GLD shares outstanding, right? So the GLD is the major gold ETF. Uh, back in 2020, the shares outstanding, the GLD were about 437 million shares outstanding. Now, uh, there are only 300 million shares outstanding. And the GLD is a measure of investor sentiment, right? When people want gold, they you know, they, a lot of them opt for the GLD. So when the shares outstanding really spikes up, you know, it usually it, it corresponds with the market top. So looking at this GLD measure, the, the shares outstanding that are each equal to one tenth of an ounce of gold are 30% less than they were uh, back in uh, 2020s. And the other thing that's going on right now, if you look back to 2020, Fed started cutting rates in uh, 2019. They cut rates from uh, five and a quarter percent in July uh, 2019, all the way down to 25 basis points in, in April of 2020. And Powell's already signaled. He's like, listen, inflation is slowing down. That you know that that's a store. That's an argue. I would love to argue with that. You know, I haven't seen inflation slow down. Says prices are higher than the 100 percent higher than they were three years ago. He's seeing inflation slow down and he's seeing the job market slow down. He basically signaled to the market, they're going to be cutting rates in September. So you have a Fed uh, rate cut cutting cycle aligned with investors not caring about gold. Uh, gold's poised for a major move. The, the last time the Fed started cutting rates, gold went from 1,200 to 2,000, a little bit over 2,000 in about a year. If you go back to 2008, uh, gold ripped uh, 200% in the years following 2008 as the Fed cut rates and poured on the stimulus. So using the GLD shares outstanding um, and market cap, which has a very high correlation to the price of gold, it's like a 92% correlation. Uh, if you look at the average market cap of the GLD uh, since 2004 inception, um, Whenever it trades above 10% above its historic average value, 
that marks a peak in the gold price measured by GLD shares outstanding. So um, I went, I uh, you know got all the data, I looked through it. In order to get the G GLD, the shares outstanding, in the market cap uh, back to an 11% overvalued state versus historic average, we're looking at gold 3,700 basically over the next year. The rate cutting cycle is like a year. So over the next 12, 13 months, I'm looking for gold 3,700. Uh, that was a lot, a lot of great info, but I have a lot of questions and I want to start again with GLD. I just wrote these numbers down. You said there's 400 million shares outstanding. And now that was in 2020. Is that correct? Uh, there's 300 mil outstanding now in 2020, there were about 430 million. <laughs> that is crazy to me. <laughs> Uh, I have no idea. I knew there was a lot of uh, uh, contraction, if you would, but I had no idea that it was that high. Yeah. So I want to push on that. Why? Uh, why Why are GLD shares out? Say, see, there's two factors that drive the GLD price because... When assets move in, right, you need to increase the shares outstanding or else, you know, the price would go up or I'll reflect in the assets going in versus the gold price. So um, it's the gold price uh, that is uh, pushing the GLD value higher and it is the ounces held pushing the GLD value higher. But quite simply, investors don't care. Investors don't care about gold. I'm an analyst. Like I'm getting amped here. Like in my GP 10X portfolio, I've got three companies that are up 150% year to date. Half of them are up more than 50% year to date. Like I see it percolating, but I don't see that uh, reflected in the investor sentiment. The average person um, is not interested in gold. They don't see it as a good opportunity for whatever reason. They're not worried about the um, devaluation of the dollar or, you know, protecting themselves for inflation. But when gold peaks out, it's like a mania. It gets wacky. They say there's no gold fever, like gold fever. You know, everyone's going to be talking about it. Everyone's going to own it. Everyone's going to talk about all the money that they're making in gold stocks. And is quite frankly, we are nowhere near that right now. We're at the exact opposite end. Even though gold's at an all time high right now of twenty five hundred dollars an ounce, it's crazy. And then, um, do you know every other turtle traders in Chicago? Yeah, yeah. All right. So the turtles, right? They got a hundred kids. They're like, listen, the only uh, you got to follow these simple rules. And, uh, you know, if you're able to do it, you can be a very successful trader like, you know, me, Richard Denners. Um, so they yes. did only three or four kids were able to follow it because nobody believed that uh, these rules were right because there were only like two or three rules. It was buy at a 20 day high, short at a 20 day low, keep your stops tight. And then what happens is you lose like 95% of your trades or scratch 95% of your trades. But those 5% of the trades that really rip higher, uh, they make your whole year. We saw it in Cocoa bumping against a ties early this year that it went up 3x. We're looking at gold right now bumping up against the ties. In the next move, it could be like that explosive one. You know, it's coming. It might not be this one, but it's coming just the way uh, that, that, you know, the, that it keeps bumping up against the ties. Okay. Yeah, I did. I agree with everything you said, but let's go back to GLD. Is that is is that an indicator of um, that this is not? And I think this is another part of the bullish case that this is not U.S. retail investor driven. Well, the the rise in the, the gold price, price of gold. Yes. Yeah. yeah no. No. Yeah. Exactly. No. It's increased institutional demand. Central banks around the world have been buying gold. You know, it's it's large um, in, in large entities and the GLD represents retail interest. Uh, so, you know, we can see by the shares outstanding that people don't have that much of their assets invested in gold right now because the shares outstanding is 30 percent lower than it was in 2020. Yeah. OK, so let's take that since nobody, none of the retail investors are interested in gold. What's going to take for them to become interested in gold? Is it is it the retail investors going to come first or is it going to be the institutional investors or does gold just have to have a massive breakout, uh, meaning going up to over 3K in order for people to just become interested again? Yeah, I, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Um, Please. Institutional investors are trend followers. They're late to the game. They 
will always chase performance. The sectors that have done the best, those are the sectors that institutional investors are going to invest in because they've done well and you need exposure to it because they don't want to uh, report to their clients after gold goes up a tremendous amount, gold stocks go up a tremendous amount. Uh, you know, where were you? Why weren't you invested in gold? So uh, they're going to be late to the game. Uh, there is big central banks are buying gold right now. Uh, the institutional money in gold equities right now is extremely small. But as you know, the the market heats up um, and gold stocks performing better, uh, institutions are going to jump in the party. And then retail is always late, you know, uh, uh, regarding AI. Like when you see it all over the headlines and all over the papers, uh, that's when retail's buying, and that's probably you know uh, a, a market peak, you know, uh, yep. not the time. And retail investors don't care about stuff until people are talking about it, but. I don't blame institutions and I don't blame retail. Like gold stocks have sucked for, if you look at Newmont and um, Barrick, their stock prices is the same price it was 20 years ago. And the price of gold 20 years ago was $400 an ounce. And now it's $2,500 an ounce. The deal is when inflation pushes uh, gold higher, it pushes mining costs higher as well. So the gold miners trade in their margins that are, um, I don't know, what are they like 50% right now? trades between 40% and 70% at a peak. Um, so, you know, the margins are the same as they were 20 years ago, uh, which is why the miners haven't moved. And um, yeah, I don't necessarily blame institutions or retail, retail for not being interested in, but um, there are times when these gold mining stocks really outperform. The big guys go, will go up 2X, they'll go up 3X. And we're at one of those times right now. Yeah. So, well, and follow that, I want to talk specifically the stocks here in a minute, but let's say we have a market sell-off and it seems like everything is pointing towards that, a recession, if you would, market sell-off, maybe this month in September, correct me if I'm wrong, is traditionally bad for the market as well as October. Yep. What happens to the stocks then, the gold stocks specifically, and would you be a buyer now or would you wait for the sell-off if you would? Yeah, I tell you what, I'm on the same page regarding that. Um, whenever the Fed cuts rates, um, it me there's a recession that follows, you know, the SOM indicator with, uh, jobless claims, you know, be uh, going up against the 30 day average is being triggered. Everything's indicating a recession is going to happen. Every time the recession happens, the Fed cuts rates, um, and then the market crashes, it crashed in 2000, it crashed in 2008, it crashed in 2019. And, uh, you know, right now it's at a high, it hasn't gone down tremendously yet. Um, and then what happens is the fed has to come in and basically double their balance sheet, which pushes gold, uh, a hundred percent higher, like two X over the next few years, every tip. Oh, every time the yield curve is inverted, like you can look at the yield curve, 10 year minus two year. Um, the simple one is, uh, the, the, uh, fed, fu fed funds rate versus the two year. Um, every time the yield curve has been inverted. Uh, a recession happened, the Fed cut rates, the, um, the uh, Fed doubled their balance sheet and gold doubled over the past few years. But one of the last things um, in 2020, it was a really quick uh, sort of uh, pull market pullback. It was a crash. It was scary, but it came back really quickly. 2008 was an absolute disaster. Mining stocks went absolutely smoked. I remember uh, wheat and precious silver wheat and trade for like $2, Franco, you know, yep. trade for like three, $5. It was you thought the whole system was going down. People were through, it had no tie to any value. You know, it was just people were getting liquid. But um, this thing, right, right, that's happening right now, everything seems to be happening faster and faster and inflation is a lot worse than it was a few years ago. And, um, you know, like I could, I, you could see a market sell off, but I could see it coming back very quickly. Whereas the market continue rising, but on an inflation adjusted basis. Like it, it hasn't gone anywhere, you know, in 10 yep. years. So I guess yep. value of the S&P being higher in a couple of years, but inflation adjusted, you're not making any money. Inflation right. adjusted, the place to be is in gold, in gold stocks. Um, and, you know, I, I've got, I, I've got the golden portfolio, which covers, call them inflation protection machines, uh, a royalty industry. The royalties are by far the best way to play gold for many reasons. I can get into that in a little bit. And then the GP10X, which are smaller explorers, developers, miners. In the explorers, um, a lot of times they they don't represent good investments, but there's certain time in the cycle that they represent amazing um, opportunity where they're going to go off 10x, 50x, crazy stuff. 
And we haven't seen anything like that in got over in decades, you know? Yep. So, you know, Vancouver, the smaller stocks are, uh, I think they're, I think they're ready to move. And that's why I started the gold portfolio in the GP 10 X. Let's talk about that. Then let's jump into it. Um, what are some of your handful of favorite companies? Let's start with some of the, the juniors, the explorers, if you would. I just spoke with a bunch of them. I was at the Rural Investment Symposium and I spoke with a handful of them there. But I'm going to another um, conference here with uh, John Fennick in your neck of the woods, by the way. And there'll yeah. be a bunch more there. Let's, well, before you talk about how do you evaluate these and then give us a few names that you really like. All right. Um, it's all about grade and people. Uh, for me, um, grade is the highest correlation to economics. Uh, if you don't have grade, uh, you're not able to produce uh, profitably produce gold. There's a lot of miners out there that chunk along at break even production due to low grade, um, and they pay off their management salaries. It ends up being diluted, you know, and they just keep on issuing shares. Core mining, um, a lot of people, when you think of silver, it was like, oh, core mining. It's like core mining split adjusted was like two, $250 per share 20 years ago. Now it's a trade of $3 per share because it's break even. Their Rochester mine is one of the lowest grade operations in you know the world. Um, and they just constantly dilute. Management and backers get rich and shareholders get shafted. Uh, so I watch that very closely. Um, I'm friendly with uh, uh, Peter McGaugh, one of the world's famous uh, silver geologists who found a mag silver in his first drill hole. And he shared with me a paper uh, called Archie's Rule. And it was about simple back of the envelope calculation that geologists can use in the field to, to figure out whether any, any uh, project is going to be economic or not. And basically all it was, was uh, you need two times NSR as operating costs. NSR is your net your revenue, your net spelt to royalty your operating costs are on a per tonnage basis. Um, and, you know, if you look at, you know, the average underground um, tonnage cost, it's like $250 an ounce uh, in Mexico and U.S. for some of the silver miners. So you need um, $500, you know, dollars of value from your, from your revenue. And the only thing that drives that, that revenue figure higher is great, right? Because, you know, you got more ounces on a per ton basis. Your costs are relatively fixed on a per ton basis. The only way you can increase, uh, move the needle, increase profits is by having higher grade deposits. Um, so, you know, I, I basically follow jewelry results on a daily basis. Um, and then I'm able to take those jewelry results. I'm able to estimate a resource. I'm able to use uh, comparables from nearby mines in order to build an economic estimate to figure out what the... Um, what the company's worth on a NAV basis and compare it to, you know, uh, what it's trading at now. And I've never seen, you know, opportunity like this where you can pick up, you know, 5 million ounces of gold for, you know, 30 mil market cap, just investors don't care. Um, I don't know. Some of my favorites, I, you know, I really like, I really, I really follow people. There's value creators in the industry that actually care about the share price that are you know, owners of the, um, of the companies that they manage. And there's a lot of the industry that doesn't own any shares. Uh, I would say greater than 50%. You've got, it's all based out of Vancouver. It's all based out of Toronto. Um, they're friendly. They, you got a lot of incestuous deals where they're taking care of each other and they're screwing shareholders. Um, you know, one deal that just happened recently that I was happy to see, Vizsla Silver just spun off Vizsla Royalties. Uh, Vizsla Royalties is trading about 50 Fifty percent NAV right now. Just started trading last week, but they spun it off to shareholders. Right, every shareholder of Visa Silver got a third of a share of Visa royalties. And um, you know, this is uh, value. This is uh, value creation. Uh, miners can you know share value via dividends, share buybacks, or you know, accretive uh, growth with the profits of the shareholder equity that they generate. But a lot of miners also they don't spin out projects to shareholders. They'll hold. They'll hold these projects in their portfolio. And then when silver rips, they'll dump the whole thing on the public. Shareholders don't usually don't get anything. So I was happy to see Vizsla, you know, do that and uh, share the, share that Vizsla royalties with shareholders. Cause you know, one of my um, greatest opportunities and one of my um, uh, greatest uh, companies that went up like an astronomical amount of like 45,000%. It was a uh, Silvercrest Mines, Eric, uh, Eric, 
fear. Um, he's a he's a great guy. He is a value creator. He's real. He's cheap. He doesn't like spending a lot of money in capex. He just built uh, list just business Silvercrest Metals for 130 million dollars. Built it on time, on budget. They paid back their uh, 40 mil uh, debt in less than a year. They generated, they got 100 mil in the bag. But um, what happened was his previous company, Silvercrest Mines, got bought by First Majestic and back in, I don't know, 2015. And the thing that, that attracted me to Silvercrest Mines was uh, the profits they generated from their, um, you know, their, their high grade uh, deposits into Alina. And uh, the company was trading on a significant valuation. It was trading at like 20, 20. Five percent generated twenty five percent free cash flow. So you know I had to get involved. And then what happened was First Majestic recognized that value too. They came in, they bought it out. And then negotiations, Eric's like, listen, you can have everything, but let me keep this little like five mile square project in the middle of Santa Relina's property for myself. And uh, Keith, you know, Newmeyer, he's like, well, yeah, all right, good. We want Santa Relina. You keep that. Uh, Eric uh, went up there. He he was visiting there over the previous few years. And it was an old mine uh, called, called Les Chispis. And he had all the old historic documents and it used to produce like a uh, thousand grams a ton, average grade. And he kept it and uh, kept drilling. And basically from day one, they kept slim and uh, massive uh, high grade intercepts. You know, a little narrow, you know, uh, three meters, uh, two meter, one meter, but just, you know, 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 grams per ton. And then the stock started trading at six and it went all the way up to 1250 a few years ago. It was absolutely insane. So grade and people. And then there was another one on Calvern, uh, which is owned by uh, Blaine McAllister and Doug Forrester. These guys are basically private equity guys. They uh, started a company called uh, New Market Gold. New Mar it was basically around the same, same time as Silvercrest. And these guys had, I don't know, $100 million and they were looking, they, they were gold guys. So they're looking in the gold industry. They waited a couple of years, but they found a uh, Australian uh, company called Crocodile Gold. Crocodile Gold owned a few assets. They own Cosmos. Um, they own Stalwell. And then um, they owned um, Fosterville. And Fosterville's a monster. And so uh, what attracted me to that company is the free cash flow generation. It was trading again at a 25% free cash flow yield. And when you invest in companies like that, that are extremely profitable, good things happen. Dividends are paid, shares are bought back, creative deals happen. Um, so good things happen to companies that generate a lot of profits. Bad things happen to company, companies that don't generate a lot of profits because they dilute. But what happened was new market ended up, um, started drilling at Fosterville. They started finding ridiculously high gold grades. It got snapped up by Kirkland. Kirkland went in there. They found like the swan zone. The grades were like through the roof, uh, like 20, 30, 40 grams a ton. They generated tremendous profits. And then Kirkland was taken out by, I think, like Nico. And then if you held your shares all the way through again, it's like a 50,000% return. And those guys are running um, Caliber now. And Caliber, they paid 100 mil for two assets in Nicaragua. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Nicaragua. But it's like, yeah, they got them at a tremendous discount. And they generated a lot of free cash from, from these assets. And then they bought, the, um, they got the Valentine uh, mine up in Newfoundland that they're developing that should be begin production, you know, very soon. Um, so, you know, these guys, they own shares in their companies. Uh, they're interested in profits and, you know, these are the companies that you need to invest your money in. Yeah, you, uh, thank you for that. And you really answered, you answered it very holistically in the why, how, what's important to you in evaluating a company, which I would agree. It's really the management and how much they care about me. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and then the grade, but then also you uh, gave us some good companies, uh, the listeners, some really good companies to consider. But let me switch here. And thank you. Let me switch here real quick. And I agree with you. Why are you such a fan of royalty companies? Uh, and I'm a huge fan. And I just really recently discovered them a couple of years ago. Um, but And they've been around, you know, for decades. But um, why are you such a fan of royalty companies now? Uh, um. Five reasons. Uh, <laughs> number one, they have fixed costs. Uh, they will go into a project. They'll say, uh, what was it? Franco, Pierre Lasson went into Gold Strike and they found it in the Alco Gazette in the 1980s. Hey, you know, 2% NSR and uh, they were down to the last 2 million bucks. It's like, here, we'll pay you 2 million bucks for that royalty. And then Gold Strike was, you know, 
minimal mine producing 50,000 uh, ounces a year. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And that that mine has generated over a billion dollars of value. And it's got another 500 mil of value based on reserves. And Franco paid $2 million up front and it, the, their costs never changed. They never paid any additional money. So the higher the price goal goes, um, the more value that they generate uh, from their royalty. And uh, because, you know, the miners, right? Like I said, when the price of gold goes up, the costs go up, you know, on a per share on a um, margin basis, their margins are no higher than they were 20 years ago because they suffer from cost inflation. The other thing regarding uh, royalty companies, uh, you can manage them with three, four, five people. You got a geologist, you got a financial guy, you got a lawyer, um, and I don't know, someone to pick up the phone. Um, so your overhead is very low. Uh, so they are able to share that their GNA is very low. So the profits go straight to the bottom line, back to shareholders. Uh, royalties uh, share at no cost to exploration upside. You know, you look at Gold Strike. Um, 50,000 ounces a day back in the 80s, and they kept finding gold and finding gold and finding gold. They get all that exploration upside. The mining companies have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to explore, to uh, to uh, to uh, grow their reserves or maintain their reserves, and the royalties get all this stuff for free. And then um, one of the other reasons is the, the, uh, the big fish always eat the small fish in the royal industry. There's a lot of small royalties. And, you know, I've seen tremendous amounts of acquisitions over the past few years, because what happens is uh, the the big guys, they're busy. They focus on, you know, deals, hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars of value. The smaller ones, they don't care about. They're just too busy. But the smaller royalties do. So they'll go after and they'll assemble a portfolio of, uh, you know, smaller royalties that they're paying, you know, 500, 500 grand a mil, a couple mil, maybe 10, 20 mil for it. And then what happens is uh, when one of these assets gets lucky, and starts growing um, and turns into a significant amount of potential free cash flow, then the, then the uh, larger cap miners become interested and they come in and they swoop up um, the, all the smaller miners. Abitibi royalties uh, got snapped up, Great Bear royalties, uh, Mavericks, Nomad, just, you know, there's 10 of them over the past few years. And I tell you what, um, one of the companies I follow, Origin, Origin, um, Origin. I met them. Origin Gold, I, Patty. The interview, I interviewed Patty. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I've been following them really closely, right? And they are um, prospect generators. They'll go out and actually, you know, uh, do their do ge geological due diligence and go seek areas. And they think this looks good. And uh, they don't, you know, they don't spend too much. They explore and then they uh, will sell that asset off. They'll uh, option it and they'll retain an NSR. And one of their NSRs turned into uh, Santa, uh, turned into Santa Elena. They got a 2% NSR in Santa Elena that First Majestic owns. And uh, they're getting, I don't know, $6 million a year from it. And First Majestic just uh, announced a big discovery at, at Navidad, which is, I think, to the east and lower than Santa Elena. So, uh, silver credit, um, so Origin's going to get all that as the mine continues. It was only going to be a five year life of mine. Now it's going to be 10 or even longer. So right. that increases the money that they get. But the, the real interesting story with Origin and the thing is Origin, it was quiet for years. You know, you're just waiting, waiting, waiting for something to happen at the beginning of, of this year. Uh, they have another asset called, uh, um, Silicon, uh, yeah, Silicon and, uh, Merlin. And Anglo Gold is the owner. Anglo Gold came out of nowhere and they announced that they discovered 13 million ounces of gold at Silicon Merlin. And then they released a rough economic study. This mine's going to produce 1.8 million ounces in the second year of production. It's going to be one of the largest mines in the world and it's moving fast. Anglo Gold was doing um, a uh, like a geotech study in order to find water. So to make sure it was going to, they were going to be able to mine there to support production. They found more gold. They're drilling for water and they found more gold, like hundreds of meters of, I don't know, two gram a ton gold. The project, uh, it's only been basically, uh, they've been drilling for a couple of years and there's so much uh, potential for upside there. But that royalty is uh, ridiculous. And Origin is represent, it's a crown jewel royalty that you can build a large company on. And, uh, you know, I think Origin is going to be taken out. Uh, over the next, I, who knows, but it's just an amazing, Silicon Merlin and the NSR is an amazing asset. And I know the royalties, are, the, the larger royalties are drooling over it.
Yeah. Let me ask you here on royalties, and I'm trying to find the downside, and I'm curious of what your answer would be. What is the downside of ro- a royalty company? So I have an 80 year old mother who invests in gold stocks, <laughs> and, and I, I'm telling her to invest in royalties here, and I sent her a few, but I mean, I'm trying to find the downside. What's your, yeah. what would you tell me? I t- well, um, s- some smart money that I've talked to, some hedgies on a New York and stuff, they're like, oh, royalties are overvalued. And I'm like, they're overvalued for a reason because they're the best way to play gold. They traded like a 20x uh, operating cash flow multiple, in, um, uh, whereas the miners only traded like a 6x on a cash flow multiple. But for those reasons why I gave you, they got fixed costs, minimal people, the uh, big fish eat the small fish. And then also they offer better diversification, right? They own hundreds of royalties. All they need are one or two to get lucky in their yeah. own. Reese's, whereas a miner, if they have trouble at one of their mines, it is game over. The equity is screwed up. You know, we saw that with, uh, uh, what was in, it? In Victoria, it's Canada. Yeah. Very old. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah it's just, the, hit, the, hit on is that, the hit on is that they're overvalued, but uh, they're overvalued for a reason. And I'm good with it. They should be overvalued. Yeah, that's a good answer. And I'm still trying to get a good answer. And that's, I think you're right. I think that's the best answer. And I'm, that's the only thing I can think of is just the valuation. Uh-huh. Uh, why would you, I think it's a great way just to play gold in gold stocks. It's just royalty companies. If, if an investor wants to do that, and maybe, maybe this is not really a negative, but maybe you don't have the upside that like, you're not going to get a hundred X or 500 X with some yeah. of these, you know? Then yeah. that's the other reason that I thought of. So yeah. the, um, the, in a strong gold bull market, uh, you know, the miners and the explorers, they're going to explode in value. The royalties will go up. I don't know, to two X a hundred percent. It's a slower, it would be a slower rise in a major gold bull market. but these gold, gold bull markets, they only occur like 5% of the time or less. So that 95% of the remaining time royalties outperform gold stocks yep. on everything else. So. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Garrett, um, I've taken way too much of your time. I think we'll end on there. I want to thank you. How can people, um, if they're not familiar with your work and not familiar with you, how do they reach you and learn more about you? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Garrett Goggin at Twitter. Uh, I'm posting a lot about the miners all day long. Um, and then go to Golden Portfolio, uh, where I sell the Golden Portfolio uh, letter as well as the GP10X letter. And we're coming out with a new one, uh, the GPIB, which contains my four best ideas very soon later this month. And we offer, put your email in there and you can get my free secrets of a mining analyst masterclass. It's like six emails tell basically what I've talked about today, what I look for in investing in, my, in uh, gold miners and silver miners. Excellent. And I want to let everybody know that Garrett is extremely responsive and very gracious. He was to me. So I want to, again, thank you so much for that. Garrett, we'd love to have you on again, maybe next quarter sometime. And we'll just see where we're at with all of this. Good. Love to do it. All right. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.